Welcome to the Unriveted Podcast, where we dial in on technology intersection of digital transformation, artificial intelligence, and people. In this podcast, we dial in on our third episode in digital transformation. John, this is our freaking third episode. Woohoo! Lucky, woo, lucky number three. <laughs> I know. And by the way, John, this episode is sponsored. It's sponsored to you by the Noun Corporation, where words have identity. Hey, John, what do you think we're going to talk about today? I'm glad you asked, Martin. So today we are going to talk about how to be boring and why being boring should actually be a requirement before you scale out your digital transformation within your organization. John, I almost fell asleep on that. I guess <laughs> that all sounds exciting. Doesn't make sense, but I'm guessing there's more to this than meets the eye. Uh, yeah, you, you'd be right. I, I admit that that statement may tend towards the realm of hyperbole, but hear me out. So uh, I think this is a big and costly mistake that a lot of businesses make when they go down the path of their digital transformation journey. And one of those things I think that organizations do is they look before they leap. And I've seen this myself, and maybe you've seen it as well, especially when it comes into the realm of implementing machine learning solutions, is every organization has heard about this. Just like when we talked about TQM and Six Sigma, it's the shiny new low-hanging, well, maybe not low-hanging fruit, but the shiny new toy in the toy chest. So everyone jumps into it, and then they start investing you know, millions of dollars in building out this capability. And maybe they achieve some, you know, quick wins, you know, right away. And uh, they say, hey, you know, this is working. But then when they try and scale it up and expand, they find out, oops, there was all this other stuff I didn't do before I got there. Does that sound familiar to you? I bet you've seen the same thing. Yeah, yeah. It sort of reminds me, of, like to take a step back and think about what some of the research analysts are saying, you know, out there in the analytics world. And I think this is where we could get into various um, ways that the data journey starts and, and, and transcends. What do, what do you think, John? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like what we talked about in episode one about starting with the data. And I'm, probably actually repeated myself in one of those uh, statements that I made earlier. But, uh, you know, obviously you can't um, say it enough is that, um, you know, organizations need to basically uh, assess where they're at in their data maturity before they build out that data strategy. Um, and I think actually you and I talked earlier about one such uh, framework or a platform. You know, it's it's always good to have uh, a framework to build around, right? You don't want to just shoot from the hip like, uh, you know, we're at the OK Corral here. <laughs> but uh, the Gartner um, Data Maturity or uh, what uh, Data Analytics Ascendancy Model, you've heard of this, Martin, have you not? Well, John, it, it's not fresh in the memory, but it does sound very familiar. Is this where we get into hindsights, insights, and foresights? Yes, yes, you're, you're, you're spot on, you're spot on. There's four levels, and we'll talk about these a little bit more, but there's four levels of moving from, you know, we're just getting our feet wet to, you know, we're off in outer space in terms of our digital transformation capabilities. And I think it starts out again, you know, how do we use data to first answer questions that say, you know, what, what happened? You know, looking in the past, like you said, hindsight. And then saying, okay, now that we know what happened, do we know why it happened? And now we're starting to move into that space of insight. And then we come to predicting, you know, what will happen in the future. And then ultimately, um, you know, how can we make what we want to happen in the future happen? And these are all different stages. They all have different names in uh, Gartner's uh, ascendancy model. But I think it's a great tool for people to use when thinking about how to gradually move from uh, being maybe a very manual, you know, shoot from the hip gut instinct organization to one where everything's driven by, you know, uh, 
data uh, models or, or, or tools. No, no, I think I'll concur with you on this. Um, how, how do you define kind of the delta between being descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, or prescriptive? Could you say that once more, Martin? <laughs> All right. I'll say it in really kind of very succinct manner. John, how, how do you describe descriptive analytics? Ah, descriptive analytics. So descriptive analytics is the the what, you know. So we're looking in the past. We collect data about something that happened in the past. And this is kind of the realm of like business analysts, right? They are looking at dashboards. What were our sales last quarter? What are our, uh, you know, our logistics costs from moving from point A to B to point C? So it's very much building out information, you know, how do we use information to still maybe use some of that human element in making decisions? I know you love human in the middle, Martin, him, H-I-M, one of your favorite acronyms. <laughs> Absolutely. It is one of my favorite acronyms. And John, it's always great to look in the past, but we like to mold how we are better in the future. And that's ultimately goes to another acronym like FER, the human error reduction. So Maybe they play hand in hand. Where do we go next? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, again, you know, thinking about it from the Gartner point of view, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily the be all end all framework or platform to build your organization around, but, um, you know, taking a step back into being more about the standardized part of this is, you know, how do we actually enable our organizational functions to all kind of be on the same page. You know, that's the whole thing when we talk about platform is, is not the software tools or the technology necessarily. Those enable us to do those roles, but how do we standardize that process across all of our teams? So then when it's time to scale up, when it's time to go from the descriptive analytics to the diagnostic analytics, that we don't miss a beat. We don't have to say, oops, you know, this team was doing this one way and this team was doing things the other way. And now we can't figure out which team is doing it right or which team is doing it better. So uh, that's one thing I want to keep in mind before we go uh, forward talking about diagnostic analytics. But um, you see this graduated approach that keeps coming up again and again when we talk about standardizing and how it's important before you even go from A to B. Sure. And just kind of like following the stair steps, you can go from your diagnostic capability and gain insights to what you could think about coming or what you could try to mold to have um, occur in the future. And, th and that would be one of the leveraged advantages of your insights from this. And where do you go from there? And how do you apply that? Right, right, right. It's, it's, it's one thing if you know you know, your business inside and out, which some people would argue that they do. But oftentimes, and this is even what we have when we talk about building out machine learning models, is starting with the data, again, referencing to our first episode, is, you know, what does the data tell you? And how can we use that to create those standardized processes for moving forward? Sometimes people standardize around their gut instincts, and they try to just automate that part. And they don't look at the data uh, in order to help build out that platform so they can move along this graduated path from asking what to asking why to asking what will happen and asking how we can make what we want to have happen in our organization happen. So, um, so again, you know, not to get too far off track, but I think that those are some considerations that a lot of organizations don't take into account. So you see there's a... You know, I know that we've broken up our, our conversation about digital transformation into more than one episode. We can see everything's still kind of intimately tied together, uh, even though we're talking about them separately. Absolutely. So you've led us to getting more predictive, potentially always stepping back and examining where we came from with the core of what is the data telling us and how, how are we finding insightful usage of it. But I want to predict the future, John. I want to have that foresight. <laughs> I want to mold the world. I want to. I want to take over here. I want to be able to do more with less. 
more with less. Well, you'll get there. You'll you'll get there, Martin. I mean that that's the thing. And that, you know, again, that's the common uh, misstep is to go straight to you know, like I said, the shiny new object. But before you get there, <laughs> I love shiny little objects. It just makes me happy. <laughs> you, you know, I think birds like shiny objects too, Martin. <laughs> so we don't want to put you in the same category as that, unless that's what you would like. But uh, <laughs> you let me know about that. <laughs> I might, I might aspire to be a bird someday. You never know. <laughs> All right. Well, let's 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 get to rule number three of the digital transformation. So our because we could ramble on for you know hours on end about this. Rule number three is standardize and don't scale your operations in your digital transformation too fast. You know, spend time, you know, uh, creating standard operating procedures, common ways of working and communication, um, using the same tools. Um, you know, utilizing all of the, you know, functionality, if you're going to invest in a software, you know, suite, for example, you know, how is that going to check all the boxes that I have? How do I socialize that across all of the people that are going to be involved in this transformation? And again, like we said previously, a digital transformation, it's ninja IT, I, <laughs> not just IT, it's everyone's involved. So, um, it's not an easy thing to do. The technology is probably the easiest thing. The ch most challenging thing is getting people on board to follow those standardized ways of working and those practices um, and making sure they do that. They don't fall back into doing what they did before. Um, so change management and the human component is, is definitely the most challenging part of this whole process. So we're building the digital factory and the digital factory. Yes. Think of, I mean, why is it companies like Apple or McDonald's successful? Oh, I'm glad you asked that because they, they Martin, uh, they have perfected and, and even McDonald's, I think they even made a movie about it, uh, that I can't remember the name of, but, uh, <laughs> I'm sure our audience may not remember it there. <laughs> it's, uh, I think Michael Keaton plays Ray A. Uh, uh, Crock, or I'm not sure what his last name is, something like that. They got his, you know, his placard up in all the McDonald's restaurants. But, the you know, it's funny as it is, the point that you bring that up is, you know, if you go to a McDonald's, McDonald's is all, they're all over the world. They're in several different countries. And granted, the menus on some of those McDonald's may be, a little different than what we have here in the US. But the point is, is that if I walk into a McDonald's, let's say in, you know, Alabama in the US and maybe a McDonald's in Toronto, Canada, you know, just to pull two places out uh, of thin air, you know, you're pretty much gonna have the same experience. If you buy a Big Mac in Alabama or a Big Mac in Canada, it's gonna be, you know, approximately the exact same product. And you know why that is? Because McDonald's has created a systematic standardized way of creating their product. And we but can learn a lot John, from that. John, from the digital John, no, 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 no. <laughs> no? <laughs> so let's go back. What's the best selling product in Hawaii at McDonald's? What is their best selling product? <laughs> Tell me what it is. Well, I have not stepped inside a McDonald's out here probably in two years or more. Um, but I would imagine it's probably like a spam, like a spam burger <laughs> or, or a spam, spam musubi. Yes. <laughs> it, 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 and you, you, you hit the keyword spam. Very popular in yeah. Hawaii and definitely not here on the mainland. Uh, True. So quite a difference in this digital realization. <laughs> but uh, wow. I mean, we could talk for a little bit longer on this, but I think it's a good time to consider what we might be talking about next, John. Um, what do you think? I think so. Anyway, let's, um, I guess for our next episode, then we will ask the question, hypothetical question, that is, what happens, Martin, when you put 20 cooks in a kitchen and ask them to make some soup? John, I, 
are we turning this into a cooking show now? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, let the audience decide that, Martin. It's been good talking to you. Thanks, John. Until next time, lights out. Oh, 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 oh,